Just kind of kick it off and uh, bring all of us up to speed of why we're here, give us some background, and then we do have uh, the presence of some uh, not invited guests. Okay, there will be some uh, some oversight as far as the design services. But anyways, welcome. Hopefully, you're here for the right reason. Uh, this is our official building committee for the Horticulture Rebuild. And I just want to sort of go around uh, the table and introduce yourself. And if you don't mind identifying sort of what role you're, what hat you're wearing today at the table. Um, so we have many different stakeholders here at the table. And it's great to give us a lot of input and, and to make sure yeah. the finished product is what we need for our students moving forward. So uh, again, I'm Andy Lickenhoek, the superintendent here. My name is Michael J. Lane. I'm chairman of the Board of Smith's Vocational. Uh, Rick Aquadro, board of trustee member and chairman of the property committee. Jim Moran, primary owner of MJ Moran Mechanical. I'm Chris Alexander, I'm a sophomore student. I'll be acting as a student. Rep. Tom Berry, I'm an architect. <coughs> I'm a architect. I'm John Parrott. Um, I have a PhD in forestry and I'm a former teacher here and I represent the forest products industry. I have expertise in wood use and wood energy. Joe Bianca, I'm the principal here. Mark Nevin, Horticulture Department. Yeah. Hi, my name is Craig Wilbur. I'm the owner's project management for this project. Uh, just for everyone's reference, uh, any public project in the state of or in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts over $1.5 million has to have someone like me to help with the uh, procurement and the oversight process. So I will be that person till the end. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Helen Fantini. I'm a project manager with SMMA. So I think I just want to take a moment and bring all of us up to speed. Uh, why are we here? Uh, so the process that we've been following since last, I think, May, so just over a year now. And then uh, so what's been happening over the last couple of weeks. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to a great presentation. So we all know what happened. Okay, last, last May we had a, a fire that destroyed a, a good portion of the building. Uh, we had, uh, thank you to Mr. Requadro, overseeing the property subcommittee, uh, had a meeting periodically starting over the summer. Uh, we hired a uh, feasibility study firm uh, to, to kind of go through some conceptual ideas and concepts and uh, uh, finalize the feasibility study, I think it was in January uh, of this year, to sort of give us a concept of what a rebuild may look like, uh, more importantly, financially, what it would potentially cost. Um, at the same time, uh, we went through a lot of financials. Uh, do we have that? Yes, which one is it? At the same time, we're trying to figure out the financials, uh, which I'll go through in, in a moment. Um, after we finished the feasibility study, uh, we went out to bid for design services. Uh, so design services, for those who are un unaware of that, basically architecture firms uh, who would want to take on the responsibility of actually designing the new building, uh, which is different than the feasibility study. Uh, the feasibility study, you may have seen some designs. Uh, that's sort of just a concept, you know, what this may look like, uh, and, and sort of get us into the, the same ballpark, hopefully, around finances. Uh, the design services will give us the actual official design. Your role here on the building committee is to provide an input on that. Uh, maybe not initially around some of the programming, okay, I think we've, I'll, I'll share some of that. Uh, more in the weeds, okay, looking at probably the teacher input, uh, student input, uh, admin input, uh, as far as the space that we need to have in, a, in the official design. Uh, but once we have some, some initial drafts of what this may look like, and you're going to see some ideas today, uh, this committee will come together and, and sort of give so I, I want to thank a lot of the industry leaders uh, to give us the input and some expertise to make sure we're going down the right road, maybe ask some questions that we may not know to even ask. Uh, so that hopefully at the end of the day, we will have uh, a completed project that will serve the needs of, of the students today, but hopefully the students in the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, so that's sort of why we're here, okay? Uh, we, do, we do have some financial oversight. Uh, the, the Board of Trustees did vote to empower us to oversee some of the financials up to certain limits. 
Uh, but then ultimately, because we are a school, ultimately this does fall on the, on the laps of the Board of Trustees who would have ultimate authority uh, of the finished product, obviously the overall budget. Um, so that's sort of the role of what we're here for. Um, questions so, so far? I just want to give everybody a quick update. Uh, I don't want to steal the spotlight of sort of the proposal that came to us uh, when it came to the design services. but. Um, let me, on the back of or someplace, there's a financial summary. Okay, does everybody have a copy of that? Um, I'm just curious. Um, in the feasibility step, were, were the, the designers uh, asked to maintain a similar number of students, maintain similar curriculum, and provide all access for uh, mobility impaired kids? Because I know that previously there were some levels to the shop space. Were those uh, considerations shared? The consideration was taken. We had yep. some great discussion around um, access being the concern. Uh, the original thought process was current footprint of where the current horticulture building is and was, and how can we uh, handle mobility issues. Uh, so that was a concern. Uh, I think what you'll see today uh, better addresses some, some of the mobility concerns. Uh, I think that's part of why we went with the design service firm that we went with. Um, so yes, it was taken into account. As far as students, uh, the number of students, what we are hoping for and what you'll see uh, through the proposal, we'll have more space than what we currently had as far as classroom space. Uh, square footage, I'm not, don't Might be a little bit more. It's a little bit more. I don't uh, know what this, the new, their footage is, but I know the other one was similar, just a little bit more. But to account for at least a, a static enrollment. Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, so as far as finances go, if you have that summary sheet, you just want to walk through. Uh, so as a committee, you have an idea of where we stand. Uh, this is probably the one area that I've lost the most sleep over, uh, is how do we pay for such a building. Uh, so thank you to the, the, feasi the feasibility study came back. I don't know why I put student. It should be feasibility study, not student. Uh, um, was 7.4 million uh, is what we came out with. Okay, now that 7.4 million does include approximately one million dollars in contingency fees, and I note that at the bottom. Uh, so what could some of those contingency fees be? It could be just unknown soil samples, and, and having you know that cost go up. Maybe it's uh, hopefully maybe the building support, um, building materials begin to level off, but we never know. So maybe increased cost of uh, construction materials, uh, so and so forth. So. That 7.4 does include some contingency fees built in. Can we see a savings there? Ideally, that would be lovely. Okay. Uh, now let's go through what we, what we have for uh, revenue sources to this point. Uh, so the first one is the, the insurance elements. Uh, one was for the, the structure. We received just over a million dollars from the, from the insurance company for the actual building. We received just over 421,000 also from the insurance company for all the lost, the lost equipment, tools, technology, so on and so forth, everything that was inside the building. Uh, so, so as you can see, if we were simply relying on insurance, we would not be able to touch a rebuild. We'd be looking at trying to, to rebuild what we lost, but then the, the current structure would have to remain, and if you had an opportunity to be down there, you would not want to be in the existing building. Uh, so we felt as a property subcommittee at the time that it was in our best interest in the the school's best interest to try to rebuild totally, uh, which is why we're here. Uh, but we have a big hole, so we have to sort of fill that gap. Thus far, we've, we've been filling the gap uh, through the Skills Capital Grants. If you're not familiar with Skills Capital Grants, uh, that's a, an initiative under the Governor Baker administration. When he came in, he created a Skills Cabinet, and that Skills Cabinet oversaw what was called a Skills Capital Grant Program. Uh, the idea is that vocational schools, as we all know, it costs a lot of money to run our schools and to keep the shops up to date. And uh, I, I keep using advanced manufacturing as, as the prime example. To buy a new CNC mill or a new CNC lathe, it costs probably a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, for that one piece of equipment. And our Perkins money that we get from the federal government, so basically our Perkins money is supposed to fund our vocational programming, we only get about $100,000 a year from Perkins. So how could $100,000 a year support 15 vocational programs? Uh, it's just impossible. Uh, so thank you to the Skills Capital Grants. We've been receiving them throughout the last 10 or so years. Uh, we've been able to keep 
many of our programs up to date. Horticulture, actually, a few years ago received one. Uh, we can talk about that down the road. Uh, so anyways, the two that you see here is a slight deviation in the skills capital grant program uh, in that the state was beginning to allow us to use some of our skills capital grant for facility upgrades. Up to this point, all skills capital grants could only be applied to actual equipment. Uh, we couldn't use it for construction costs. Uh, they changed that. In this first one that you see, that 600000 uh, we wrote for a grant, received the grant, and up to 30% of that grant could be applied towards construction costs. Uh, and that equates to $600,000. Uh, so now, there's a shell game. I won't get into all the, net, the nuts and bolts of the shell game that we had to do to, to get that grant, uh, but you may have seen it in the newspaper recently, or if you're here, you probably saw us in the animal science building that's going on. So we're doing a shell game there. But we do have $600,000 that we are able to apply towards this particular building project. Is that a one-time application or is it annual? That's one time. It has to be spent by 2025. It was a multi-year grant. Uh, same thing with this larger skills capital grant, 3.5 million. It's actually a $5 million grant that we built for and received. Three and a half million of that could go toward the facility upgrades. So 70%. So that first one is June 30th, 2024. Yeah. Thank you. The bigger one is the one. The okay. So the larger one, 3.5 million, that's 3.5 of 5 million total grant, and that's 70 percent of that grant to go towards facility upgrades. Uh, so we were able to receive that, uh, which is really saving us, or at least getting us closer to the ultimate goal of building this project. So thank you to the skills capital grants. Without those two, you can see we're not even here today talking about it. Build. Next on the line, uh, last summer, you may have heard in the news, uh, the state, um, they were trying to figure out how to, to deal with some surplus money. And then, unbeknownst to everybody at the state house, uh, there was this obscure law that if there was too much uh, revenue, they had to basically turn it back to uh, the taxpayers. So many of us may have gotten some, some money back. Uh, but then through all of that, uh, the state was able to finalize a budget, and uh, Senator Comerford, our local senator, uh, added a, a bond bill amendment to that particular process uh, in, in the amount of 275000 So we. We are receiving that from the state for this particular project. <clears throat> Smith College, a wonderful neighbor down the road, uh, reached out to us. Uh, I wrote them a letter. Uh, they reached back out, and they're giving us $150,000. Uh, in essence, $75,000 over two years, so that there's $150,000 for this particular building. And then the monetary donations, about $39,000, just shy of $40,000. That was uh, imme immediately after the fire, and we put a call out for donations and, and whatever the community could do. And we received a, a lot of small hand tools, uh, wheelbarrows, so on and so forth, um, uh, gift cards to stores so we could begin to, to replenish the lost tools and equipment. Uh, but we actually did receive, again, just shy of $40,000 in cash donations from just individuals out in the community. Uh, so if you add all of that up, we've just crossed over the $6 million threshold. Um, but when you do the math, that's about $1.4 million short. Now, I say 1.4, that's hopefully worst case scenario. Again, we're assuming up to a million dollars in contingency. So during the design phase, if there's any way we can get more real numbers and, and maybe save some money, that would be lovely. And uh, I think you know, the board's been talking, I've been talking with the board on how do we close that gap. Uh, that's not necessarily a charge that we have to take on. If you have any wonderful ideas, I'm all ears. Uh, on how to close that gap. Does the school have borrowing capacity? Through the city. Uh, we have a cell tower. I think people are up to notice of the cell tower that we have actually up on uh, the, the forest land. We receive rental income for that cell tower. Uh, sort of the unwritten agreement we've had uh, that that cell tower revenue we try to earmark it back to horticulture. So any potential agreement we have with the city when it comes to borrowing, uh, there may be some expectation that at the school we're on the hook for some of that. But technically, it'd be a bond that the city takes out. Uh, we've had because the mayor is on our board and she's aware of this gap. Uh, she's aware that there may be a conversation that we have to have on a bond for the city. Uh, we are trying to avoid S uh, an SBA uh, for this particular project. There is a larger project on campus that has to happen at some point. Maybe after we all retire, but. Uh, 
MSBA is a whole other ball of wax that we're trying to avoid in this particular project. There's another regulation that's on the, on the books that we've talked about. I just want to be open and honest with the committee. Um, there's a, a capital assessment regulation that we could pursue. Uh, this was on the books uh, at the State House because of Minuteman. So Minuteman Regional down in, in uh, Lexington, uh, when they were building their new school, uh, their, their districts are more affluent, wealthy communities. But Minuteman also served at the time many students from Boston. And the communities didn't necessarily want to be on the hook to build a new Minuteman if a lot of the students were coming from Boston. And Boston was, wasn't then on the hook to help pay for the new Minuteman. Uh, so the state came out with what they call this uh, capital assessment, uh, where we could, we could assign a capital assessment, so the cost of this particular building, we could assess through the non-resident tuition program. So as most of you know, you two probably don't live in Northampton, correct? Okay. So your individual towns are actually charged a non-resident tuition rate you need to attend here. Okay. Um, so they're responsible for that. Uh, you don't pay it as a family. Okay. Uh, so the town pays for you to be here. On top of that tuition, we could actually assign a, a capital assessment to that particular bill so that your towns would have to pay a, a part of that. The reason why I've been adamant not to pursue that, again, we have a much larger project someday that we may have to pursue, that we would definitely have to, to use that <coughs> capital assessment uh, regulation. Uh, the second one is just ethically, uh, we are talking about one building that supports one program, that's horticulture. And the capital assessment would go to all students. And many of those students uh, are not in horticulture. And there's a good possibility that a lot of towns that would receive that capital assessment would be paying for a horticulture building and none of their students are enrolled in the horticulture program. So and we found there's an ethical dilemma there. So we're trying to avoid that. Uh, so with that said, again, we're approximately a million dollars short. Uh, most likely we will have to talk about borrowing okay, through, the, through the city uh, unless there's some other avenues that we can talk about. I just wanted to give the committee sort of the background of where we were, kind of where we are right now with, with the finances, and uh, I just want to turn it over to, um, through the design, I just want to give everybody an update, not an update, and I just want to do an introduction. So through the RFQ for the design services, we received, I forget how many proposals. Four. We received four. We interviewed, um, we had a subcommittee review them, and uh, two really stood out. Uh, one was the firm that did the feasibility study. And one was SMMA. And uh, what really stuck out for us with SMMA, one, we have a local tie, I'll be honest, okay? Uh, so there, there was a local connection and, and a, a commitment to the program, which goes a long ways. But more importantly, I think what you're going to see here today is a proposal and a, a concept that not only deals with the, the building that we have to rebuild, but it begins to provide a vision for the the entire agricultural complex out back. Uh, it begins to tie everything together. And uh, I think, uh, you know, back to uh, to Jonathan, your, your, your vision of are we servicing students now or 50 years from now, I think what you'll see begins to look at agriculture as a whole as our flagship program, and it really showcases it uh, if you pursue this as, a, as an official design. Uh, the presentation that we that we received was top notch. I think we had expertise around the table that answered a lot of the questions. Uh, so as a committee, we we decided SMMA was by far the best proposal that we had. Uh, it answers the, the building needs that we had, but it also answered questions that we didn't even know we had, which was how do we make the whole complex uh, more unified, uh, tie it together. Um, so with that said, I'll stop talking. Uh, so come on up. Okay, great. I think you should give the presentation. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, help me setting up. Uh, I'd like to give just an update of what we've done and where we're going um, today. Um, <clears throat> so we've spent the last two months uh, putting out the RFQ request for qualifications for the architect and the engineer through the requirements of uh, 149, 149A public construction in, Ma in Massachusetts. Uh, we did it through a qualification-based process, so we didn't look at cost as much as we looked at qualifications, skills, local ability, local understanding, um, and based on that, we scored um, appropriate 
the four that had submitted. The four that submitted, just for record, was D21, EDM Studios, SMMM, SMMA, Kids Practice, and Deets and Associates were the four that did submit. All qualified, all very good firms. Uh, Helen will, will show you what we loved about her presentation currently, but in the next two months we will be adding to the design team. We will be hiring a, a land surveyor to do an ULTA survey on the property. We'll do some more environmental testing of the property and we'll also hire a geotechnical engineer to do some, some boring so that the team has the appropriate information and when we start looking at sites like we're looking at today we'll have a better understanding of their capabilities. So in with time, that... Uh, in, in timeline we want this building to be completed in the spring of 25 so we're moving our students back in by the fall of the 25-26 school year uh, which means there's a lot of work on our, our place between now and then. Uh, I think the design aspects, you'll talk about all of this, probably through what, January, February, someplace in okay, less than a year and then we have to go out to contract uh, for construction services so we can actually build the building. Uh, but again, end date will be in the spring of 25 is our goal. Well, um, hi everyone. Uh, again, my name is Helen Cantini. I'm an architect and project manager with SMMA. If you say it too fast, another M gets in there. Cindy Smaney McKee. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the firm. But first, in full disclosure, I am the proud parent of a Smith Folk student. My son, Owen Abrams, <laughs> is a junior. So you're nodding your head. And um, yeah, Smith Folk has been amazing for him. Uh, he was not thriving in the South Hadley schools and um, this place is paradise, really. Um, he, he's horrified, but I, we, when this opportunity came up, I jumped and said we absolutely have to pursue this project. This is such a special program, a special place, and one of the components of the program is a climbing structure. And so Owen said, okay, this is what you need to have. This is what it should look like. So we immediately <laughs> made a sketch and we, we did include it. So um, I'm sure he'd love to clean it up himself, but um, this is the real deal. This is pure enthusiasm and joy and inspiration. So um, a little bit about SNMA. Um, we are a large firm, a multidisciplinary firm, architects, engineers. Um, been around since 1955, so very um, story uh, firm. Um, work in many markets, but really K-12 is, is our um, strongest, um, most enduring studio. Um, we love doing school projects. Um, you know, we really believe good ideas come from everywhere, art and science together, the architecture, the engineering, working side by side. Um, it, it's really why I love working there. Um, and, you know, again, our goal is responsible, responsible to cost, um, durability, and, and all, all of your goals, well-crafted, venturesome, and beautiful is um, definitely part of um, what we do. Um, this is just a, 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 a very large <laughs> list of, of projects, of, of locations where we have uh, executed school projects, both um, only, you know, sometimes <laughs> only master plans, but um, you know, um, full uh, building projects really across the Commonwealth. A few in um, Rhode Island, we do have a province office, which I didn't mention, um, but we um, work really all over the state, so. And we've assembled, assembled a really great project for this team, in addition to our own in-house architects and um, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing and fire protection engineers. Um, we've brought on a Berkshire Design Group, for civil and landscape uh, landscape architecture, um, worked with Rachel on many projects. Um, she's a great inspiration um, as a designer. We have uh, we do have an out of house structural engineer uh, RSE. Um, they do have experience in um, cross laminated timber, which we see as a potential opportunity for this project. And um, of course, we have uh, an independent cost estimator in AM Fogarty. They have great experience estimating schools, again, all over the region. 
Um, we also have a, our own sustainable uh, design uh, group that does energy modeling, so we'll be able to keep that in-house as well. And um, as already mentioned, you have a very ambitious schedule, is what we're calling it. Um, and um, we think we, we can do it. We know we can do it with certain things falling into place. Um, so decision making and, and good engagement with, with the school, with the <coughs> stakeholders, um, making sure we get um, our investigations on sites um, done because those things will inform cost and um, in making sure permitting falls into line. Some of those things, you know, we can uh, have control over, some not so much. So um, again, we understand that the goal is to um, really hit the ground running, um, cost estimate throughout the process, and schematic design, design development. Um, we're saying 75% CDs to again make sure that we're hitting the budget uh, before we go out to bid. So, and again, we understand that you would like to be in the building in the spring of 25. So that's what this schedule is outlining. And some of those permits, um, you know, we what we met uh, last week, um, just a, a list of, you know, the things that we all have to be aware of and keep in mind. Um, you know, a, a few of these can be really started up once we get into design development. So we do need to have enough of the design determined in order to start these processes, which we hope to do around November. Um, so in terms of an approach and what we were thinking about when we saw this incredible opportunity here at Smith Locational, um, pardon the metaphor, the pun, we couldn't resist it, but it really is very much about not just a single building project. Um, so as the metaphor implies, um, we really very much do see this as a campus project, a campus opportunity, horrible, tragic event, fire, losing more than half of your building, um, but it is also an opportunity, right? <coughs> and so um, here is situated building E in its full form, um, pre-fire, um, it's fun. And you know, thinking about you know what you see from Locust Street as you um, take that long view, that view corridor um, down to Building E, you see garage doors right now. Um, nothing wrong with garage doors and utility, um, but you know it's uh, it's a very very tight site. It's really kind of in the middle of a lot of things. Um, and this is the um, the footprint of uh, the feasibility study. Um, plan, which, you know, I do really congratulate the work that was done previously. Um, a lot, I know a lot went into it and kind of honing down the program and really trying, you know, working with the budget, um, you know, but this, this proposal does put, situate the building right back where it is now. And you can see it kind of has to contort a little bit to um, meet your programmatic square footages um, and fit in that location. So coming in with fresh eyes, we said, okay, well, is there someplace else this building could be situated? And so we looked just to the east. Um, so we look, really looked for places where that almost 10,000 square feet of program on a single floor, going back to the accessibility piece, could fit. And so um, we, we thought, you know, the, um, southwest corner of the um, just of the game field um, made some sense. It also frees up the existing site to become a focal point, a heart uh, of campus. It's something you will be able to see. And so again, this, this provides some opportunities for what can happen in that, that place vacated by Building E. And here it is in sort of a uh, 3D uh, version. Um, so again, you know, finding a spot to accommodate the program on a single in a single story, and opening it up so you can see some of those beautiful barns that that are um, south of Building E right now. And this is showing, um, you know, the programmatic blocks. Um, so we do have a, a plan a little further into uh, the presentation, but you know what can happen in that central focal point. 
Um, so we know there's a climbing structure as part of the building program. But could there be an exterior one as well? Could the greenhouse that I think was conceived of as being relocated <coughs> stay where it is? Um, could other things happen in that very central moment in campus to draw the eye, to draw activity, um, to make a place? And so here it is from a site plan view. Um, and, and again, kind of look, shifting over back to the building and seeing the opportunities that um, with a very simple building form, we might be able to you know, have a green roof over a portion, which would allow for teaching of concepts of extensive and intensive green roofs, a PV array to, to help with um, energy generation. Uh, we do recognize the grade changes, and that is certainly something that, you know, early on we'll want to get a topographic survey. There is grade change uh, north to south and uh, west to east. Um, we believe we can find that sweet spot that makes sense and that all accessibility, um, you know, um, code required accessibility aspects are met both from a site and a building standpoint. And so, again, kind of going back to thinking about that focal area and a recognition of grade change, um, certainly the, the image on the right from Berkshire Design Group, you know, shows, you know, how you can sort of situate um, landscape and gathering space um, within hillside. Uh, the image on the left is um, a healing garden that um, Rachel from Berkshire Design Group had done. Um, you know, again, just simple use of paving and grass and trees and moments to gather respite and relax but also you know teaching spaces outside so um, you are all outside working a lot um, but maybe some more formalized moments where those things can happen and then here is a view you know from that central new newly created focal point um, exterior climbing structure wouldn't that be amazing um, towards the new building E entrance. And so you kind of see it nestled in into the hill. Um, very simple forms, um, lots of natural light being pulled in from high. Um, and, you know, referencing and respecting the vernacular, the agricultural vernacular that's on the site currently. Are there two greenhouses currently? Is the, the distal one going to stay? Because I haven't seen it in the imagery. And that's why we're here. So right now we have one greenhouse that's attached to the building. Yes. You know, we have a hoop house that's off to the side. That's what we currently have. Uh, so there will have to be discussion. Uh, you know, right now this proposal is maybe to keep that greenhouse in that focal point. But then you'll see there's a second greenhouse. Uh, so do we want two greenhouses? Or do we want to truly move the one that we have down to the new building? <coughs> And that frees up more options for that focal point. Close discussion. Right. And again, this is you know um, an option, right? If you if you can't relocate it or, and do want to retain the one, if in the future you want to put the greenhouse, you know, um, attached to the new building, we're mindful of budget. We're mindful of you know things that may need to be layered on in time. So um, there is some flexibility that's that's um, conceived of in this plan. So again, this is a reaction to what was in the program that you know came out of the feasibility study. Three classrooms, a simulator room, um, very simple, straightforward um, circulation, shop spaces all in line, um, that house and greenhouse obviously connected. Um, we're showing the tools storage um, in board in the in the thought that perhaps again flexibility wise down the line if you wanted to change the the sizes of the shops you could do that because um, again we're thinking of this as um, an opportunity to consider and assess the use of CLT cross laminate <coughs> laminated timber um, contrary to what you might think um, it's quite fire resistive having been through what you've been through. Um, so safety is obviously a, a huge concern, um, but marrying wood with this program just made so much sense. Um, and so again, simple structure, straightforward, catching light, um, and absolutely celebrating wood. 
And so, you know, to use the tree analogy, again, couldn't resist each layer um, telling the story. We'll start with the, the roots, I suppose. Um, so again, um, consideration of mass timber structure, um, lots of natural daylight being pulled in. Um, the flexibility aspect that we think is, um, is a hallmark of this particular plan that we put forth. Um, energy efficient envelope, of course, we'll, we will be meeting the new um, stretch code. I know Northampton is a stretch code city. Um, again, support supporting <laughs> the cross laminated timber, um, potential for the green roof, um, and then a simple sloped roof where we could see um, rainwater being captured and funneled into a cistern. So, you see that in one of the renderings. Um, again, potential for PV on the roof. Uh, the cupola, which is the um, top of the climbing structure, and it's sort of a signal, you know, that this is this is the horticultural and forestry program. Um, and you know, also a recognition that trees will be impacted here. So, um, you know, is there a way to tell the story of what was there? If this is the site, um, these images were taken from Lyman Plant House at Smith College. You know, how can you document? How can you respect? How can you tell the story of wood, trees, what was there, um, and incorporate them into into um, the building? <coughs> and um, that's that's it. We uh, again, we're absolutely excited, thrilled um, about this project. Back to the Bruce I do sort of sure. the just want to update the community on some other projects. Uh, happening. Yeah, this one? Okay. So just to, to have the committee up to speed on what we're looking at, you, you know where the football field is, that uh, top building on top, that's a B building, that's where the gymnasium is and whatnot. Uh, you see the new focal point, that's where the existing horticulture building is. To the left of that, you see it looks like two separate buildings, the kind of barn-like structures. <coughs> the one on the right, the longer one, is no longer there if you walk down there. Uh, we took that down a couple months ago. That is going to be the site of our new companion, companion animal growth, i.e. dog kenneling, grooming, uh, training facility. Uh, so that will be an educational use for our animal science program. So keep that in mind as we begin to go down this road of design. And that's going to be another focal point. Uh, we may have public coming in to drop off dogs. Hopefully it's more going to be staff dogs. Uh, but that's going to be a, a, a true hub of, of activity. Then you see the largest structure. That's our MS farm. Uh, I think most, most of you are, are well aware of that particular structure. But again, the vision of our animal science program is to begin to offer all of the concentrations under animal science. One of them is e uh, yeah, equine. And we have a couple courses on campus, but we don't really have a full-blown equine concentration. And we want that someday. So we haven't gone too far down that particular road, but one initial thought process is uh, sort of on the, would be sort of the north end, okay, the right side of the, of the long barn, okay, coming off to it towards the bottom, that paddock area. We're thinking of like a forest stall horse barn somewhere in that area, uh, most likely attached to the MS barn. One of the positives of this potential concept that you're seeing is uh, compared to the former feasibility study concept, when we were looking at putting a, a, the, a horse barn there, it was going to really infringe on the potential new horticulture. It would be pretty tight. Uh, this provides more options when we're looking at that equine barn at some point. Um, so I think you're talking about the, the two greenhouses. Okay, uh, This particular image is a little out of date. Um, where if you look back at the MS barn, you see it looks like a little index coming off the top. That's currently a classroom. Oh, it's the the point greenhouse out. is down here. Yes, yeah, it's, it's right there. So this picture is from oh, before. Oh, this, this one right. here, yeah. We moved that. Well, Mark's looking at right here. We moved it yeah. right there. Yeah. Uh, that little, it looks like a, a tumor growing off the side of the barn, <laughs> yeah, on the top side there. That is currently a classroom. We have now, uh, displace the students out of that space. That's going to become another educational learning area called um, Pocket Pet Lab. Pocket pets are your gerbils and your rats and your snakes and your birds and rabbits and all those fun animals. 
so that will really be sort of an animal <laughs> hub, whether it's MS bar, large animals, there will be small animals in there. As Mark said, that hoop house is now moved. So back to the question of two greenhouses, do we want two hard shell greenhouses or do we want one attached to the new building? Do we want to add a second poop house as an option? Might be a little cheaper. Uh, so those are conversations you know, we can definitely have. But I just wanted the committee to know that, and, and this, I'll get to one other thing, is this focal point was a selling point, at least to me and, and to those who are looking at this proposal, because we have so many other things happening down back that that focal point might be able to tie in all the, all the new learning that will be happening. And then lastly, on the right-hand side of, of this drawing, uh, you see another structure sort of hanging off the edge of the, the picture there. Uh, for those who have history, uh, that used to be, years ago, used to be an indoor firing range. Uh, then, my history, since I've been here, it used to be the Northampton Park and Rec building. And then it used to be uh, leased out to Greenfield Community College, <coughs> home with their LPN program. And then we did not renew that lease last year, this pre-fire. And our vision as a board and as a school was to really ramp up our animal science program. Uh, that really is the future of the school uh, and, and the, the flagship of the school uh, and, and why we want to expand our concentrations. But in order to expand the concentrations, we needed the space. So we needed a place for all of the animal science related classrooms to be and a space for the animal science instructors to have their office space. So we, we took back that building that Greenfield Community College was leasing out to us. We took it back, we renovated it over this past school year. So now all of the animal science related classrooms are in that building along with their the instructor space. Uh, so with that said, if you walk down there right now, uh, and again, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, there are problems that we didn't even think about that SMMA came in to say, let's tie this all together. If you walk there, down there right now, that building where animal science is based out of seems a little isolated on campus. Uh, they're kind of by themselves. Um, and this, this particular concept begins to tie it all together. Uh, it's one school, one ag complex. So I just wanted the community to see some of the other pieces that are you know, we have to keep in mind. Uh, I know we're here to talk about the horticulture building, but uh, maybe it's a better chance to see the bigger picture of a lot of new pieces that are happening. So I just wanted to share that. This plan also allows for the existing horticulture building to remain intact. So in the case that you aren't able to move out in early spring or summer of 2025, you have the option of having that program still intact. So that gives us some risk management. And we can keep using it. Right. Currently. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, you won't lose it. The whole process, which yes. will be very helpful. What's occurring on the former tennis courts? Is that, is there a solar array there? I yes. Just, that came after I left. Is solar that array. place up for grabs? Could, could, that, could that landscape be used for something different, or is it set? Right now, it's half its solar panels and half it we utilize for storage of uh, materials for landscaping. Um, all our rock and process firewood, we practice <coughs> driving equipment down there, so it's in a contained area, so it's you know easier to control the kids, and we cycle them through stuff, so it's. It is well utilized. But if we took that away for something else, we would have to have a different area, which we're actually yeah, working towards anyway. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and just one again, I more thoughts. I appreciate it. I want the community to really be up to speed. There is discussions with the city. It's sort of it was front burner. It might be side burner. Okay. Uh, the city is looking for a space for an animal control facility, i.e., dog pen. And uh, we've had several years of conversations. Um, the city had some money set aside to build an animal control facility. And we never had the space, and we really didn't have the programming to sort of align with uh, an animal control facility. Because we never had that companion animal concentration of animal size. It was always a large animal, as a livestock. Now that we have this vision, again, this is pre fire, we had the vision of expanding animal science. That sort of rekindled the conversation with the city of, you know, maybe there is a relationship that we could have with the city with the animal control facility. Uh, they are struggling right now financially, same thing that we're dealing with. Okay, how do we pay for such a building uh, with construction costs, where they are. But their vision right now is, again, same screen, lower right hand corner okay, of the screen, kind of up against the, the tennis courts, okay, if you're familiar with the tennis courts might be a building. So again, it would tie it all together with this concept. It wouldn't be off by itself. 
But again, as a space that we have to at least acknowledge could be used at some point in the near future. <coughs> I was really glad to hear you say CLT, energy modeling, and have a mindfulness of embodied carbon. Um, I took the liberty to chat with DCR, and they have 50 grand worth of CLT that won't donate. So that put us in a better spot. Um, also friendly with a lot of uh, sawmill owners who are willing to donate materials as well. I think the notion that a wood uh, program should have wood to touch see wood, what wood turns into, and talk about why it was harvested and how it was grown. Makes sense. And so the wood industry is eager to support that. Um, for those of you who are familiar, the, the John W. Holbert building in UMass Amherst is a wood building. It's one of the biggest in the nation. It's now no longer the biggest. Um, we go 14 stories of wood now. And despite what we learned when we were kids, wood buildings, CLT buildings, are more fire resistant, oddly enough than conventional materials, they char. And so ultimately it gives the occupants the opportunity to evacuate. And so taking the, the life and limb as the highest priority, a CLT building is in fact a safer building, even though we use wood for campfires. It has a, a look and feel that's quite different, um, and it has a very different story from a carbon perspective. It can be made from Massachusetts wood, um, I reached out to EEA with the hopes that they would be willing to meet the difference because CLT is often more expensive material, even with the 50 grand. This is a very expensive building, so 50 grand is helpful, but not maybe a difference maker. But perhaps EEA would see fit to, to cover that distance. Uh, that's an important consideration. There was an announcement last Monday with the moratorium for harvesting on state lands. And part of the announcement was there's going to be a think tank. It's going to take another six months. The luminaries will sort of make their hands and pontificate on it. But as a parallel to that sort of pause, there was a commitment to support the wood industry. And so my suggestion to EEA was, well, this would do that. If you're looking for a place to, to invest, well, no better spot than an educational opportunity to, to help the next generation of land managers know how to do it more responsibly with words like carbon and sustainability on, on their lips. Um, so I commend you for all that. Thank you for having that consideration. And thanks for having a great kid. <laughs> Thank you. Pretty partial to it myself. <laughs> I, I, um, I really like where you're going with the building. It makes sense. I also really like the outdoor learning yard. But it seems like there are still a lot of moving pieces with that design. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, what of that could possibly be phased? It might be wise to mm -hmm. push that into a master plan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to see that learning yard happen because it's super cool and it works so nicely with the building. But maybe it doesn't happen, you know, maybe it's not designed by September. <coughs> um, and instead, continue working with BDG to do a master plan for all the things that are in play in this picture. Yeah. I think you're right, Tom. We, we had talked about that. A lot of this is um, best case scenario. Uh, we'll phase a lot of this, in, in, and as we go forward, the, the building committee will have that information, can make decisions on how they want to go forward. They want to pick something over the other, or if it's an alternate, or again, part of a master plan. I think we all realize that the vision probably won't be 100%. And, and yeah, that makes me think, I assume that this bottom line number was for the DEETS design. So Helen, how does what we're seeing compare? We won't know. We don't know? We don't okay. know yet. Yep. Yep. But we'll do some schematic and schematic. you'll do the cost estimate. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly you feel like it's a, a less bent approach, a simpler structure, <laughs> but yes, there's a... A, a bit of a premium on CLT. We recognize that. We've been talking to, you know, CMs that we know that can provide a little bit of that info. But um, yeah, that first SD estimate is always really important. It's when we, we've scoped the project appropriately, we've described it well enough to get that first glance at a number. 
I have, I have a question because this is a public space, a school building. Forgive me for sort of being naive on this, but when we go watch the Patriots, we go to Gillette Field. It's not where they sell razor blades. They're selling the advertising. Is it possible, legal, to have Schmidt equipment parking here and, and CL Frank parking there? Um, it just, I, I don't know if that's possible. We could be learning in the Northern Tree building. <laughs> but but I, I don't know if that's legal. That's, that's the like fundamental question I'm asking. That, yeah. that Eversource and National Grid are big <coughs> players, and they hire arborists. And they would be interested in supporting something like this, if in no other way than to build the outdoor climbing structure that says, brought to you by the great folks who you give money to every month. I guess it depends what color the sign is. <laughs> but, but I don't know but, but, no, if that's legally allowed. That's what I'm, I guess I'm asking. Like, donated materials. Like it. it's, yeah, it's a great question. It's definitely a question that we've been talking about mm -hmm. internally about other building issues that we have on campus. I'll just get the firm answer. I think we're at the point now where I think it's great. Well, there's a, there's a legal question, and there's also like a desire. Do you really well, want? I, I think what we've been talking about internally, and I think that's where we'll have to get the answer from the attorneys in the city. I think there's a fine line between soliciting that and donation that comes through. No, I'll solicit it. That's fine. You don't have to do that. But 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 I don't know if you can legally receive it. That, that's why I want to make sure that I don't put yeah, the committee yeah. in sort of a funny place where like there's a company that's eager to do it, and then you say oh, I can't, and they go great. What else can you do? And you use the sports part of it. Yeah. Uh, we we've been looking at our fences in regards to advertisement over the years. Mm -hmm and uh, so for supporting the sports programs. So it's not totally out of the picture. It's been discussed, and, uh, and I think it's a great idea. It depends on how the donations are funneled as well, yep. and, and how those are discussed. And we can help with that so that it doesn't get anyone in any predic predicament with state. But it may not be the desire of the group, too. And that, that's as well, too. That, I mean, we may want to give the building a haircut instead of doing this. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that's mm -hmm. fine. I just want to make sure that it's possible and then decide what it's wish for. The phase approach definitely came up during the interview process. Uh, and other phases that we talked about, is I'm worried about the bottom line, to be honest. And um, the green roof scares me a little bit, probably as a former principal and dealing with student management issues um, and maintenance issues. Um, and the, the solar panels are great. I love the concept, but can we afford them right now? But can, is that a phased approach at some point? Uh, we so can. There, there's companies that will put it there. We'll buy the power off our own roof for a PPA, reduce costs. So, so don't don't spend the money. Just save money. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I like the design concept because that's part of the committee. You should put panels on roofs nowadays. In fact, the city's mandating it in many places. And so if we do it with no outlay, then all of them. I think the building design has already been mentioned. I think it's a simple design compared to what we have during the feasibility stuff. I think the construction cost, I can't see how it would be more expensive than what we I think my concern as far as cost would be more of the site work. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this would be more, more site work involved compared to what we were looking at before. So you know, we, we might be saving some on the building, but then we're spending on the site work. Back to the thing, the phasing. Uh, of but we're we're assuming that there were no accidental leaks around the oil tanks, and so there could be dirty dirt issues on the existing site, and it'd just be easier to work off the fill. Absolutely. Yeah. If we can build outside of that yep. boundary area, it yeah, makes put sense. a garden there instead. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's encasement. <laughs> Does this satisfy the campus's flow needs? That this is definitely a, a, a better artery. Yeah. But if, if folks are coming in to drop off dogs or some pocket pets or whatever, that there's expectations of who are you on campus and why are you here? And does this provide adequate flow and safety for folks walking campus? That's, that's the two reasons why I got excited when I first saw this come, come to me. Was one, it's a more simple construction design. As a property subcommittee, how many meetings we were debating the, the, the programming needs of the, the building and uh, the elevation changes and how do we deal with all of that? Uh, this, I think, answers all of the, the building concerns that we had. Uh, but then it began to answer the larger question around flow on campus, and we weren't even talking about it. Uh, 
working, and the more we got into it, the more it made sense because of the division of capital and the size. So I personally think it answers those concerns. Good. Feel free to chime in. Yeah. yeah, I think so. But the people that are coming on campus during the school day is very limited. You know, they're going to have business here. They're going to have be checking in. There's going to be things. So it, that won't disrupt the normal practices. Um, you know, if they're going to the dog grooming facility, or they, they, they have appointments, or they're known. And like Andy said, mostly the dog grooming. When you look at dog grooming facilities at other schools, it's staff only. They, they don't. They're limiting what pets are coming in, how many are here. You're not talking about multiple people throughout the day. You're talking about one or two, <coughs> three animals, because you're not crossing over a lot. So there's a lot of other things that you're thinking about too. So I don't. I don't see that disrupting the flow. I think that design helps. But I think. It definitely pulls your eye in. Uh, educationally speaking, I think we're up of different ideas for that space that might make sense that don't need to be shared now. But um, yeah, I think it's a good design. And I look at it that center circle can be as big or as small as we need it to be too. Mm -hmm. That allows a little more flexibility for adding on later and stuff. Is there any concerns about plowing in the winter around that? I just don't think there ought to be, but it's just a Thing that we're not thinking about snow banks right now, but there will be yeah, okay. quite a bit of open space. They can, they can push that around the rotary down towards the back of the property. Sure. I'm not a snow plow expert by any means, but um, as long as it's a plow with driveway, which is going to be meet road conditions, it should be fine. And, and the, the service yard is a paved yard, I presume? Right there? No, there's a, a lot of that's on paved and back. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. So it's like crushed stone with concrete, right? And the pads, you know, pads and yeah. crushed from it. I, I think don't know what the plan is. Yeah, I mean I think we have to look at the at the needs okay. and the money. Yeah. yeah. We have to talk to you about what what, what, what makes the most sense. Spot down there is pretty empty, and kind of the isolation and stuff of that other building kind of brings it all in there. I don't know. Especially when you need building standing, mm -hmm. for as long as you need, that's really helpful. Well, what you're saying too is part of this the, the building that Deets had um, suggested would basically cut off the back part of the, the site by obscuring any vision. This is going to allow to be able to see down through that roadway and be able to open up and see what's down there now? Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah this is the, the uh, plan from the feasibility study. Um, you know, again, similar sighting to the existing. And I think those red hash marks are basically showing the barrier it, it creates? Exactly. Visual barrier, right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, when you think about safety and security, it's much better to have the, the building design flow that you're proposing. Security could be answered with cameras on some point, too, on the outside if we're concerned about traffic or public concerns. Yeah, we have we have a system. We would definitely expand it. That would have to be part of the building design, mm -hmm. interior and exterior cameras. And the, the layout of your proposal uh, and the location be it more one-sided mm -hmm. of a building mm -hmm. um, as a teacher standpoint um, student supervision right uh, that one actually still leaves a lot of the hidden mm -hmm. areas that our old building had that students could mm -hmm. go and hide in and you know it's a lot of work on our part to keep track of where they are the new site is very easy for us to look out and see where students are in the back half of the campus um, so uh, student management wise it's going to be a whole lot easier and better yeah so much of what's down there now uh, in my opinion is wasted space so your design uses a lot of it and it allows more like the Andy's point and expansion and, and other expansion on that back side because the property falls off to the pasture uh, and at that where you see the trees um, 
so that, that all goes down to the depression. So you, we have limited space already, but you do preserve quite a bit along the backside that's still usable. How does it work being up against the field there? Concerns? We have, we have some concerns. Uh, I think building design is going to have to take into account people trying to get up there and watch games and things like that, but I think that's just something we'll have to think about as we, we get to that point. Yeah. You know, it does look like it's built somewhat into the hillside, which allows for, a, a, you know, that roof height is much lower and probably enticing, so we'll have to keep that in mind. Yeah. And then how close it is to that field. Yeah. As well as if there's windows or something, right? Yeah. Balls and all sorts of stuff getting yeah. zinged around yeah. and smoke yeah. the windmill and shatter it. So. You have lacrosse here? Yep. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> and we do find a lot of balls along that fence well, and down the hill there. Seating, like, we can, uh, yeah, we, even, we could have that seat. We box seats. That's right. That's what's You can win them. There you go. That's right. You can make some money and win them. The companies. Maybe the superintendent's box. <laughs> John, in that picture there in the bottom right corner, you can see the solar panels and the tennis courts. Yeah, thank you. The other thing is there's a lot of the automotive vehicles that they use down there. I don't know where those would be re relocated to. About 90% of those are getting surplused out. Okay. Yeah, they won't be used. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's going to change the parking structure down there. But. Yeah, another thing is, would there be parking for maybe staff that in that kind of uh, related classroom for animal science and all that stuff too? It's really not feasible to have another access point to campus all the way through, is it? Is it? Uh, it would take quite a bit of construction. I mean, there is another access point coming in from the rear through the orchard. Um, that's a, it's a dirt road. It's really just a farm access road really now. There's, well, there's two gates. There's um, a bridge as well. I don't know that I would want that to be an official. Yeah, you'd have to come over the brook. Yeah, I'm sure the there'd be a ton of, uh, quite a bit of approval and cost to building that. Um, does Cooley have any interest in having uh, a gate off of the tennis courts? Because the, they have a parking lot back there, and there's an egress there. I, I don't know if the fire marshal would be for that. There is. Yeah, they also use that area for the, the furnace in the back of the chips. There's a lot of unloading and loading the large trucks. I mean, safety-wise, we could put a, a, an egg. We could easily, in a different way, add an exit. But we try to limit the amount of flow from the hospital for certain from certain reasons yeah. you come onto campus. But I think, yeah, safety access wise, I mean, that's something we could think about on the side and as part of a different project. But and you know, it, it, almost go, it could almost go by the White House. But and fire services, if like fire codes changed since yeah. this was built and so there needs to be different we have access two, egress. Yeah, we have two from Locus, but I don't think it's a, it's a good question overall for campus. It certainly seems like this design is more conducive to getting fire trucks around campus. The, the corner of B has always been a blind spot. Yeah. And that's something the fire marshal may have a comment about, and that may change the site plan a great deal depending on what they need for access for engines. I'm not sure what the size of the apparatus is here, but I'm sure it's pretty big. Mm -hmm. so. Well, they got backed up, right? When we had the fire. We they all got trapped in between the building and, and uh -huh. the field, in a way. That's interesting. They kind of got stacked, stacked up. You know, stacked up. Right. It was also dismissal when we were trying to get everybody off campus to open up the campus. I'm wondering if if we can't provide better access, whether the fire marshal will expect more sprinklers to add to the cost. So if we'd say, well, the cheaper option is to provide this gateway with you get the key, and can we have standard sprinklers? Well, yeah, likely we need sprinklers regardless. Oh, indeed. But, but yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously, the they reason for our meeting is because of yeah. fire. Yeah. They may want more hydrants. Yeah. They may want a turnaround area. That back road might be a fire road. I mean, I'm not sure going over a bridge doesn't sound very good. No. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is almost being able to have like a turnaround down there. 
kind of where that sir is here and the other existing dirt road on the side is. Yeah. Almost having a loop to kind of turn around there rather than going around the kind of front that mm -hmm. It's going to be a K turn or something that yeah. we created. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's central. Okay, that would be the better additional access. I, I think so. Because there's a gate for entrance in and off that bike fields for safety vehicles. Good crowd. You uh, bring up really, really good points. So next steps. Next steps. Uh, yeah, well, we're we're um, getting officially underway, and um, actually we'd like to visit with you um, next week. We know school is ending. And it's uh, half days. Uh, no, no school on Monday, but half days, Tuesday, Wednesday. We'd love to get a group of us in, um, looking at Tuesday. Okay. Mr. Nevin, Mr. Ansbach, um, you know, to, to meet with you, to talk to more students, to, I, I know it's a game day, it sounds like, so it won't be business as usual, but, you know, let's, let's, let's plan together, let's talk about, you know, things well, that the you program need. needs in the classroom stage shops. Yep. I think you're going to see the adjacencies have changed from Dietz's plan, which might align more with your needs. So that's something that's going to have to be probably the first discussion is, does that current plan work with all of the adjacencies where the offices are, where the classes are? We, we already talked about that, and there's already some switching we want to mm -hmm. yep. so look at doing for that. But it would just kind of just be shifting things one way, left or right. I, mean, I know a little bit about how what you do here, but my team needs to meet everybody right. and, and hear yeah. it firsthand. And um, we don't want to make any assumptions. You know? so I'm not starting from scratch, but um, I'll be putting some emails out to try to get some dates together. But we are trying to hope for as soon as possible so that they can get running on this. We're going to push them very hard on time, so we want to give them opportunity. If the design includes CLT, that's an if. I think it'd be virtuous to invite Peggy Clouston, Dr. Clouston, and you, Matt Sammers, to come talk about it. She, that, that is her field. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so she's New England's, if not North America's, expert. Um, and she designed the lower building. And she is, her research is trying to get CLT made out of Massachusetts woods instead of spruce fir to see if a CLT facility would be appropriate for something. So she knows better than anyone the tensile strength, the fire resiliency, and the cost. It's a good idea. And has good relationships with manufacturers. Yeah. Schedule will be a big factor as well. If we're going to be putting bids out in January or February, it gives very little time for production and um, purchase. So anything we can do, we'll talk about that as far as procurement options to make that quicker if we can. Um, but I know the cross timber right now just seems to be pretty long lead times. Um, I think that's because it's being used so regularly now in this area. It shows like the diagram oh, shows some of the additional space for our Yeah. So I just, <clears throat> to let the full committee know, uh, I applaud the property subcommittee and the work that happened over several months try and, I kept calling it the Taj Mahal, I think the initial design for the feasibility study was how many square feet, like 30,000 square feet, we were gigantic. Um, and we kept paring it out, paring it out, paring it out, paring it out, to in essence seeing the spaces that you see up on the slide. Um, and uh, I know I'm pretty hard on the, the bottom line, the financials, and I just want the full committee to know how the property subcommittee came up with what you see up there. Uh, and one that jumps out is, is the simulation. You may think, uh, depending on who you are and, and from your perspective, it's easy, let's just get rid of the simulation room. Well, we have the simulation room because we're getting the grants. In essence, we got the grants because we wrote for the simulators. The simulators were able to, there was a high price item that we were able to write into the grant to get the grant, so we have the money that we have for the building project. So, uh, and these are the simulators, if, you, if you're unfamiliar with uh, these are like full-size hoisting equipment simulators. And if you went to like an arcade uh, with your kids and the kids had enough, you know, the, the driving simulator is basically down in steroids. Uh, it's gigantic. Uh, I think we're getting like, how many of them? Four. Four. Uh, so the space need is basically a classroom dedicated to the simulators. Uh, 
address. So I just want the community to know that's the purpose of that one particular space. That really isn't the space that we had to make them look by and we really can't come back on that one particular space. The three classrooms, uh, back to the future needs of the program. Right now, the existing or former building had really two classrooms. Uh, we are hoping for a third classroom for potential expansion. Uh, if you begin to offer more concentrations under the horticulture program, we can need that space. Uh, so ideally, we are adding a third classroom over what we already have. Beyond that, uh, obviously a facility, uh, the faculty office space, uh, obviously the laboratory is fine. Uh, the head house retail area, uh, we currently have like a head house that sort of also was sort of the retail space, the, the, the dual role. Uh, if we have a greenhouse down there, it makes a lot of sense, I think it makes a lot of sense for the greenhouse to be down there, uh, to be attached to the head house and the retail space. I think that's important. Uh, and the horticulture, the, the shop space, obviously I, I love the concept of multi-use and being flexible because what we're teaching now might be different than 40 years from now. Uh, I just want the community to know why we came up with those spaces that we've come up with. Uh, there's a slight expansion of the classroom space. Um, this square footage that came up, that was looking at comparisons with the existing classroom space on campus, right? Looking at the largest academic classes that we had, that kind of got us in line. Uh, so that's where that square footage came from. Are the existing classrooms either or smaller than? Uh, smaller. Okay. Do we have a sense of how many square feet this building is? It's the, it meets the program that was in the feasibility study. So I think it was 9640, you know, just around okay. 10,000. Got it. Without the greenhouse. So with the greenhouse, yeah. So we pretty much follow what was right. in the, the feasibility study. Discussion around in the classroom space. When it comes to related, horticulture isn't necessarily, you know, you're not only isolated to horticulture related, there's a lot of interdepartment related. So you may have, you might be teaching a related with animal science students are in front of you or ag tech students are in front of you. Uh, and the classroom space was at a premium. The, the new animal science building has helped, uh, but we didn't necessarily gain classroom space with that building. We only have two classrooms. And next year we're going to have three animal science instructors. So, so we gain the one in the building building. Sure. Yes, but that building is complete. That will be a mixed use. That's going to be sort of a retail space where the ducks come in, process the dogs. That space will be also a dual purpose as a classroom. Correct. Okay. So Program. We try to envision multiple departments using potentially this space. Sorry, yes. this is the, the program information that was given. Currently, you have enough for 48 students in the existing uh, facility, 12 per grade. This gives you the ability to add 18 additional students over time, as well as one additional teacher. Correct. So that's the method behind the program. A limit of 12 per grade, is that still accurate? Right now, yeah. That, that program took us six months, we really studied it, it was a lot of work. We try to hone down what we truly needed, get a look at finances. Are, is this design in the horticulture shop and the equipment shop, are they like conditioned spaces or non conditioned spaces? It's a standard that they are conditioned. So. Okay. Any other questions? I can help you with? Thanks, Holly. Great, yeah. Thank you. So your next step we will work internally to try to gather some of your support on that. Um, as far as official large scale building committee, steps. Um, I don't want to waste anybody's time. Um, probably a subcommittee, we sort of got into the routine that we'd be meeting in the afternoon for the board meeting. So I was like, hey, guys, the example, the board meeting at 5 o'clock. Um, we have a board meeting in July. Um, 
July 18th. I'll look at you, Craig. By July 18th, are there going to be topics that we would want to come together as a full committee? I think so. I think in the, for the next few months, um, monthly meetings will be important to update and get approvals. <coughs> so July 18th, is that what you said? Does July 18th work for the, the committee? If you can't, I mean, we're not going to hold you to the five. You can't make every single meeting, obviously. Pay is the same. Is that the pay is the same? same. <laughs> Selfishly, it needs to stay on Tuesday. Tuesday's board of directors meeting. So we'll work out. I won't be. So can you help me understand, kind of, it sounds like there's there's this committee overall, and then there's some subcommittees. How often are they meeting, and who are they? So the subcommittee, my understanding of it correctly, uh, I'm feeling there's only one subcommittee, and that's really the clear now. We need to have some answers in that. So I'm looking at instructors, some student input, admin who have to manage the staff, to say, well, what do we need in this space? So it's not the design of the building. It's Space, like kind of programs, program, still program, program. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, this, this committee, I feel, should have oversight of basically the building project in general. Um, what does the building look like? Where is the building? What's the site plan? Um, everything else. So, yeah, mechanical. If you have ideas, recommendations, questions, I, I don't have that expertise. So, you know, having you at the table would be really important to get there to say, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. Uh, you know, from the architectural perspective, obviously, from the industry. Uh, so, each of you, I think, have an expertise that we want to have you input. Um, I think today was just an update. I, I wanted those who've been part of the process to understand why maybe we shifted with a different concept. Uh, so, I think this presentation was excellent for that. I think as we begin to get into uh, July 18th, by that point, maybe the programming might be a little more nailed down. Um, but to begin to talk about what this building truly really looks like. So by my math, we have three meetings until we have to get to yes on SD. We have to stay with yeah. SD. Yeah. If I were you, I would want a little bit more feedback than three meetings from us. So. I don't know if, if there's a core group that, that would meet every couple of weeks or something. I, obviously, that can be flexible. And maybe different people at different times. But I know if I were you, Helen, I would want mm -hmm. more feedback than those three meetings. Yeah, monthly can be tricky, especially in such a compressed schedule. And given the vision you have for what this, this group is going to do. Okay. So. And maybe it's going to be something, depending on what the needs are. Yeah. Andy, what I can do is put a milestone schedule together, so decisions that this group will have to make over the next three months, mm -hmm. and the dates in order to make the schedule work, so that will put everyone in line to be at these meetings if they feel it's important. If they can't make it, that's one thing, but this way it'll inform people of what we're doing that day. Um, there'll be quite a few decisions over the next three months we'll have to make, um, and we'll have to reconcile budgets, present those budgets before we move on to the next step. So um, give me a, a week, and I'll put that together, and you can send it out. And not everybody who is on the official building committee is sitting here today. So we have a board with you, mm -hmm. OK? Um, I'm just looking at the list. So we have an advisory member. So again, if you're not familiar with Chapter 74, we have to have advisories for each of the programs. We have an individual who will represent the advisory program at the table. Um, Lenny Roberts, if you're familiar with Lenny, uh, he's also in trades, uh, so he is also on the committee. And Will Coffey, who is the city procurement officer, so he'll obviously be working behind the scenes to make sure that we're following all the procurement laws. Uh, he's also on the committee. Um, otherwise, welcome. I really appreciate your time. Oh, and uh, yes, Tim Smith. Uh, I don't forget him. So, to, as a facilities director, uh, he was not here today, but uh, a lot of the operational decisions, talking about flow and plowing and whatnot, uh, he'll be vital uh, part of the conversation. As you reach out and learn, can you inquire about donated materials? How how is that possible? 
Um, and you know, it obviously has to meet code and expectation, but I'm sure there's some oversight in how that can and should happen. Play in July 18th with the next official larger meeting. There may be some need for subcommittee work if need be. I'll reach out to individuals if we need to. Uh, anything else? Appreciate it. Thank you.